Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to take a look at the United Nations, which was created on June 26, 1945, and talk a little bit about how it's progressed over the last 75 years. The UN is celebrating, or will celebrate, its 75th anniversary in October. My guest today has been monitoring the UN, has been actively involved at the UN for at least 17 years. My guest today is Dr. Robert Zuber. Dr. Zuber is the Director of Global Action to Prevent War and on Armed Conflict. Dr. Zuber, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thanks for having me back, Bill. I appreciate it. You know, normally, Bob, when you've been here in the past, we talk about nuclear weapons. We yeah. talk about nuclear, the peaceful transfer of nuclear technology, which is so important. Uh, but, and today we're going to talk about a little bit of a different topic, but I'll bet we bring nuclear into it at some point. We might. It, it is so critical. It's yeah. so critical. But let's uh, talk a little bit about the United Nations. I mentioned it was formed June 26, 1945. It's going to have its 75th anniversary. It's a relatively young institution, but it was created out of the ruins, the ashes of World War II, or almost at the end of World War II in 1945. And today in 2020, the UN, the agenda has changed, the mission has changed, the areas, the important issues have changed. You're, you are a scholar at the UN, you study the organization, you work at it assiduously, studiously. How do you view the UN in just in general terms over the past 75 years? Yeah, thanks, Bill. It's a, it's a very big question. Um, in a short amount of time. Yeah, in a short <laughs> amount of time. <laughs> no, indeed. Um, well, I, I think you know I'm, I'm trained as a, as a counselor um, and studied philosophy, and I've spent a lot of time with, with personal transitions, you know, marriages that have approached the 50-year mark, uh, people that are transitioning from school to to adult life, et cetera, et cetera, and all of the what all these transitions have in common is is that it allows people to look back and to look forward to figure out what they've done, what they haven't done as well as they would like, and chart a path forward that inspires confidence, that can inspire people in general um, to support the organization, um, to support it with their with their money, to support it. Um, by doing things at local level that, that, that engage the, the core missions of the United Nations. Um, I think when the UN looks back, uh, there's, some, there's some remarkable things that the UN has done. Um, I think maybe the most important, uh, some people say, well, it's prevented another world war, although we certainly haven't had our any scarcity of wars. But one of the things that, it, it, that you notice in the difference is that we now have 193 member states uh, instead of 40 or 50 or 60 or 70. And all of this is a function of the UN's ability to broker decolonization, to, to change the, the geographic and cultural dynamics of the world, and, and to create more self-governing spaces. We're not done. There's, I think, 19 more spaces that still need to be um, to be made uh, self-governing, but that's an extraordinary achievement. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty is, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it is an achievement as well. And there have been a whole series of recent achievements um, that have, that are kind of half a loaf, right? The, the you know, the Paris Climate Agreement <coughs> and the Madrid <laughs> follow-up um, mm -hmm. clearly are not getting us where we need to get on climate change. Um, the Global Compacts on Migration um, and Refugees set normative frameworks for how we should treat these people on the move, these, this vast number of displaced persons around the world. But um, it, there's nothing binding about those, about those compacts. Um, there are suggestions. It's like, in religious terms, it's the difference between the Ten Commandments and the Ten Suggestions, right? <laughs> and what we have here is the Ten Suggestions. And, and whether it's on migration, whether it's on food security, whether it's on climate, whether it's on nuclear weapons proliferation, um, the UN is an, an amazing um, enabler of conversation, but it's not as skillful as it might be um, in terms of getting countries to do the things that they promise to do. And if you look at the charter, um, the charter makes it clear that, that, that there needs to be some kind of accountability for states that are constantly in violation of the charter values. There's even a, a part of the charter that talks about suspending states that, that, that violate 
um, that violate such values. We don't, we, don't, we don't implement any of that, right? I mean, states are more or less are free to do what they want within their sovereign authority, and the UN can cajole and prod and try to get the larger states to provide, to, to make better examples for the rest of the membership, but at the end of the day, the members do what the members are going to do. And so, looking forward, we have to figure out how the UN can continue to inspire people um, while not having the mechanisms at hand, and nor the funding, but certainly not the mechanisms mm -hmm. to compel states to do the things that, um, that, they've, that they've promised to do. And it's a really big problem for the system. Mm -hmm. And over the years, I've heard from so many experts on the United Nations and from people who look at the UN, study the UN, or are involved at the UN, it's often said that the UN provides, you, meant, you alluded to it, that it's a convener, right. brings 193 countries of the world, brings in the private sector, brings in the non-governmental organizations, the labor folks, the interfaith, or the faith-based groups, service clubs like Rotary International, Lions International, uh, Kiwanis International, just on across the board, and provides a forum for them to deal with these problems, such as climate change, such as nuclear proliferation. But I've heard for years that the United Nations, even with its technical expertise and uh, qualified staff and that type of thing, can never be more successful than the individual member states who actually carry out the programs and who make it successful. And you, you alluded to the um, climate change agreement, yeah. 2015, I think it was, December, along in there. Everybody was just ecstatic because well, it finally- as Well, they should have been. They yeah. should have been. It mm -hmm. finally cracked a deal on this. Uh, all was like uh, 200 or 197 countries or something signed on to it, or 197 entities, roughly. But anyway, the point being that now we see that just recently we had a follow-up conference, a five-year sort of, uh, let's see wh how well we're doing, in Madrid, and the countries, the UN was there, the technical expertise was there, but the countries weren't there. They yeah. just really didn't get involved. Yeah, levels and of enthusiasm how did you, and energy how did, were how very you, low. How did you view that? Well, um, I, think, I think it's not uncommon for individuals or NGOs or states to, to kind of run from failure. And, <laughs> and we, we are, uh, I mean, people don't, don't want to sit with those questions very often, uh, not nearly as often as we should. Um, my, my sense is that, um, is that governments realize that, the, that in order to implement the commitments they made at Paris, that they were going to have to make changes at domestic level that they weren't necessarily prepared to make. Moreover, we've made a, a mistake on climate, which we make in a lot of instances here which is that we assume that governments uh, and the UN system together are, are in and of themselves sufficient to solve these large global problems on climate, on displacement, on food security, on pandemics, et cetera, et cetera. And so what we, what we don't do well here is localize. We don't, we don't throw problems back to local level and say, we can't do this without you. We can inspire you, we can assist you, we can, we can network you, we can convene you, but at the end of the day, this has to be d dispatched at local level. And, and the other issue about the convening, I think, which is something the UN needs to be looked at, is that it is, it is profoundly not a level playing field here. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the Security Council, we have the, the, you know, the US, Russia, China, Britain, and France, the permanent members. Um, we have 10 non-permanent members, but uh, we know where all the power lies. And, th and there's never been a real dissection of what role elected members to the Security Council play in, in the deliberations of the Council, but also in the resolutions of the Council and the implementation of those resolutions, which, as you know, is, is really problematic. Mm -hmm. So we have, a, and, and <coughs> in terms of the non-governmental organizations, there's also a, a profoundly unlevel playing field. Um, there are too many organizations here run by people who look like me. It's not a good thing. <laughs> you know, it's like we're over that now. We, you know, it's, we, we have 193 states and we need to engage productively with civil society as though we are a 193 member organization and not just a collection of, of Anglo 
English speaking, whatever it is that I am, I mean, I'm a nice guy and all, but let's be real about this. This is, you know, I'm not, I'm not the, f I shouldn't be the face of the system, and people like me should not be the face of the system. So figuring out a way to, g and, uh, and a, a colleague in India just wrote me this morning and complained about this at a UN meeting that she was covering for an Indian newspaper. Mm -hmm. Where is the diversity? Where are the civil society groups that we know are <coughs> populating? that are, are, are prolific around the world and doing all kinds of really interesting and hopeful things, where is the space for them in this place? And how do we sustain that place rather than being merely a one-off or uh, you know, this sort of you come, you, you say something, you depart, no one ever hears from you again, and there's no mechanism for really staying engaged with you. That is certainly a problem. There's no doubt about it. And th I guess we know the problem now how do we do that? Is this something that's going to have to come up from the grassroots, from the uh, not all 193 member states, but from a large number of them? Or will it come from the top down, from the Secretary General uh, at the United Nations? How can there be more involvement of so many of the other players who are really sidelined to some degree is what we're talking about? But how can we get them involved and to be in a decision-making situation or be part of the decision-making process? Well, I think, I think, I mean, this is going to sound a bit sappy, I suppose, but I mean, a lot of this has to do with mindfulness. I think that many people at the UN, you know, will, will talk about how we need more NGOs, which usually means the NGOs that are, are well branded or that they're funding and doesn't mean NGOs generically. And there's a tendency at the UN to kind of lump NGOs mm -hmm. together, right? So. So states have a very kind of distinct brand within the system, but NGOs are just this lump of, 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 of advocates and, and, and pressure groups that are, that are all together doing whatever it is that advocates and pressure groups do. I don't think that that's an accurate portrayal. Um, and I think that the, that the fact that some governments, some governments don't like NGOs at all, fair enough, but that some governments l tend to lump us together and uh, you know that there's no disaggregation in terms of what we want well how we think what we're paying attention to um, how we keep them accountable how we keep ourselves accountable so there's the the disaggregation is a real issue but the the, the governments that lump a group of NGOs together into a, this kind of mass are probably not going to be as sensitive since they're not disaggregating anyway, they're also not sensitive to the disaggregation that we still need to do, which is getting more people from different backgrounds, different social classes, different cultures um, to the UN on a semi-permanent basis where they can learn the system, learn what the UN can do and what it can't do, learn where the UN is headed and who's helping it forward, mm -hmm. um, and make the contributions that will help the UN in many ways, but one of them is to help them honor promises to constituents, because we don't have enough, we don't have enough constituent diversity in the building to make that case, and we really need it badly. Yeah, you certainly do. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a website, you have a computer, you like our programs, please feel free to distribute them. We do that at no cost to help people better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're taking sort of a macro look at a really a major institution, one of the most important institutions in the world, and that is the United Nations, which was created in 1945. And we're talking about some of the strengths of the United Nations, but also as it celebrates its 75th birthday, what can it do over the next 75 years to be even a more effective and a more efficient organization? My guest today is someone who's worked inside the UN, not as an employee, but with an, a, a non-governmental organization, has a keen perspective of the UN. Dr. Robert Zuber is the Director of Global Action to Prevent War and Armed Conflict. Bob, we're talking about the United Nations, and uh, as I think back to the, um, we were talking about the Paris Climate Change Agreement, which I was one of those people who was very 
just ecstatic when this I came too. online. No, is is one of the challenges that the UN, and you've alluded to this in some of the comments you've made, is that instead of having so many voluntary agreements, should there is there some way to maybe put some teeth into some of these agreements that everybody would agree to? I know it's difficult to do because you have 193 sovereign states, sovereign countries who jealously guard their sovereignty. There's no yeah, doubt about they it. They do indeed. Every one of them. And uh, it's not a, I'm not uh, <laughs> being unkind to them, but it's just a fact of life, and it's normal. I would understand that. But should some of the agreements have more binding resolutions or something like that? Well, I, theoretically, of course. Um, the, the, the most binding resolutions, of course, are this in the Security Council. And mm -hmm. the problem increasingly over time, and we're in the Council pretty much every day, um, the problem with the resolutions is that there is, there is less and less adherence to them by the permanent members themselves. Mm. And so, again, it goes back to this issue of large states setting a better example for, for other states, being more mindful, being more attentive to needs that are not their own needs. Um, in the case of the Security Council, you know, the resolutions on, on Israel, on the Iranian nuclear deal, I mean, there's the, you, can, you can go down the list of, of resolutions that the Council, in many cases, felt good about, where there was clear consensus, but in the implementation phase, things just, just mm -hmm. tend to unravel. Not always, but, but much too often. And so it, it, you know, I say this to people all the time, if, if, if somebody makes you a promise and you don't keep it, the next time they make you a promise, your, skeptic your skepticism rises to, mm -hmm. to accommodate mm -hmm. your experience of this person <coughs> breaking promises. And I think that what, what's happened to resolutions at the UN is that there's been this kind of uh, a, a, a diminished sense of respect for them because the, 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 mm -hmm. the people know that once the resolution is done, they can wash <coughs> their hands of it. And, and they don't have to be as attentive to the people out there who assume that a resolution means something for their lives mm -hmm. and is a, is a redress for something that they actually need in their communities, right? Uh, the mitigation of violence, the, you know, the attentiveness, attentiveness to food security or, or the problems of displacement, the, the human rights issues uh, uh, around the displaced. And so we don't, because here, we're all good. You know, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm good. I, my life is fine. Not too many bad things happen to me. Not too many bad things happen to any of us here. It's very easy to forget what the implications of the promises that we make are on constituents who have a, who have a, who have a desperate, in some cases, need for, for service relief. And we, we have, we have got to be able to think harder and better about circumstances that are not our own because our own circumstances are not compelling enough to generate mm -hmm. the, the kind of follow through that, 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 that people need from us. Mm -hmm. the, the best thing about the UN by, by far, and, and I, I, you know, I credit the leadership for this very much, is that you would be hard pressed to find a critical global issue that is not regularly on the agenda of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. we, what, if, if it's out there and it needs attention, there is a place within this building that's giving it attention. But the downside of that is, is that we are now, we are raising expectations around all this, this, this mm -hmm. huge body of issues. And my fear is, and I think some other people have it, I'm not sure, um, is that if, if the UN can't demonstrate somehow more effectiveness around these global issues, that the large states will take individual initiatives which will be in their own best interest but not necessarily in the global interest. And we're seeing evidence of that all around the world now, or of, of, of countries just going back to kind of unilateralism and unilateral perspectives. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, our weapons are too big, our problems are too severe, our climate is too damaged for, for 
mm -hmm. for those kinds of those kinds of initiatives. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's it's very worrisome when we hear so many of these countries talking about nationalism, talking about well, I'll just go it alone. I don't need anybody to help me. It's almost like we're trying to go back to pre World War One, and we see how well that didn't it's turn out. Just, oh and gosh. we th this is we see a weakening of the European Union. We see a weakening of NATO. We see the United States withdrew from the Iranian nuclear deal, which was total disaster, and now we've destabilized that region. Iran will probably move forward in developing a nuclear weapon. That's not going to end well. So the, well, the, the end idea end. that individual states or a small number, two or three of them can solve the problem, doesn't work, well, maybe in a few areas, but not these big ticket issues no, like not that. Big ticket areas. And this is the thinking, and there has to be a discussion, and there is, I'm sure, mm -hmm. at the United Nations. There, there are is. scholars who are talking about this and trying to explain why, even though the international multilateral approach doesn't always work, it's still mitigated most of these problems to where there have been more successes than failures over the past 75 years. Absolutely. And we look at, uh, in fact, just imagine if we did not have a United Nations. Just imagine. And we'd have to invent one. We'd have to invent it. But yeah. in this climate, with all of the bellicose comments and really to come right down to it, um, low information comments, to be quite honest. That's sometimes. A, that's a polite way for saying know, they, don't, they yeah. don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. But the, uh, they've got, there's got to be a place in there for a United Nations and one that helps us to deal with these problems. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. But the, the fact that multilateral, mm -hmm. I mean, we're obviously <coughs> ardent supporters of multilateral processes, right? And we would be happy to make the case under any circumstances that from a purely effectiveness standpoint that multilateralism trumps unilateralism. Mm -hmm. However, that's not an excuse for multilateralism to not change its ways, right? To not, to not be willing to demonstrate uh, in practical terms that it's got the back of the world in some significant way. Mm -hmm. um, both through its work changes in its working methods, but also in, in doing things that maybe aren't efficient but are symbolically effective. For instance, you know, like why why do we why don't we have climate summits on Skype? You know, why why the the, the environmental footprint of the of the uh, of the mm -hmm. events that we stage to address the environmental footprint is staggering. And you know, I mean, what does it mean to have so many private planes parked outside of Davos and have so many parties and receptions and so little movement in terms of, of global polity and, and, and work on, on critical global issues? This just doesn't make any sense. And I think people are looking at this now and not being entirely sure what to do about it. Uh, but, and many of them are just, you know, turning up their noses and walking away. I mean, I see this on our, our Twitter accounts and on our email all the time, mm -hmm. that people are just like, you know, you're wasting your time here. Well, I don't think we are. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that the diplomats who work very hard and some of the NGOs who work also work very hard, I don't think they're wasting their time either. But it's clear that we haven't demonstrated that mm -hmm. there's still a tone deafness about the UN. Uh, that, that we don't really understand that the way in which we do our business communicates to people that we are more concerned about our own well-being than and our own positions and our salaries and our and our and our recognition and all that than we are about global mm -hmm. constituents and I just think that's a, a non-starter. Mm -hmm. And there's also a tremendous lack of information, especially in the United States. I think it's worse in the United States than it is in other countries <laughs> because <laughs> other countries well have be. UN agencies. Yes, of course. You go to the Dominican do. Republic, the UN Environment Program, the UN World Health Organization. Or you go to Oklahoma, yeah. where I'm from, or Kentucky, where you're from, and there's no, you know, where would you, where would you <laughs> exactly. get local UN information? It's exactly. very hard to it's come by. It's very yeah. difficult. Yeah. And so we really have folks who have heard a lot of misinformation from right-wing talk radio and what have you folks. And some from left-wing too. And left-wing yeah. too, yeah. sure. Let's give it credit on both sides. No, absolutely. But they do not have the information. They don't realize that the United Nations helps to move aircraft safely around the world, to move ships safely on the high seas, to move letters. Create standards for stoplights at street corners. Exactly you know, I mean, right. like just the, in, the amount of, <laughs> of stuff that is being filtered through here yeah. and has been done in the, in the name of, of multilateralism is really staggering. But we still have a problem with displacement. We still have a problem with nuclear weapons. We still have a problem with climate. We still have a problem with food security. We mm -hmm. still have a problem with 
um, with you know disaster response, and so and so it's like. God bless the UN. Let's get busy. You know, I mean, I think those. Are, I think that's the only. Uh, that's, that's that's exactly right. A great way to end the program because climate change, and I hope everybody around the world and around the United States and every country realizes, this is going to cost us even more tomorrow. The oh insurance my. companies right now are reeling from all of the expenses that they're being hit with, and it's not going to get any better. No, and we better will be, will deal be, with yeah. it now instead of tomorrow or the day after because we're not going to like the end results, but. Dr. Robert Zuber, I'm so glad we figured all this out, and I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you. I hope we did figure something out. I'm not sure. We did. <laughs> okay. okay, thanks, Bob. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.